I'm going to record now. Because <laughs> uh, then I can send it out to the group. So we're in our May 2020 network meeting. We're excited to have all of you with us. We've got some special guests. Um, I'm Erica. I'm one of our network coordinators. We also have Donica with us here today. Becca will be joining us a little later. Um, got lots of wonderful guests today. So just to give everybody a sense of what we're going to do today, we're going to hopefully get some garden updates from all of you. We'd love to hear who thinks they're still going to be growing this summer, maybe who hopes to have guests come to their garden at any point. Uh, just whatever updates you've got, we know that that's not going to be true for everybody and that's okay. It's not a normal year. Uh, then we've got exciting new demo to show you. Donica is going to show off the new website, which we're very excited about and tell maybe give us a little, everybody a little background of all the students that did the work on it. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that. And then we've got Kat Kutz with us from the Smithsonian Earth Optimism team. She's going to tell us a little bit about that initiative. They've uh, provided some additional support to our ozone garden network this past year this year uh, so we're excited to have her share a little bit about what that means and what other resources are available to you as gardens and then we've got a couple members of our tempo science team here with us to talk to us about air quality and pollution um, and so when their screens come on we'll introduce them as well so um we'll start with who's growing Who's expecting visitors? Who needs assistance? What do you guys got? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So anybody that wants to talk, feel free to unmute yourself, turn on your video if you want. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that, um, that we're interested in who's growing and expecting visitors, but also what kinds of things that we can do to support you, whether or not you're growing the gardens throughout, the, throughout this particular season. Um, I can start, I guess, by saying that NCARS garden, the um, perennial plants, which are the milkweed and the coneflower, will be growing again this year in the front of the building. And because it's outside, we'll be able to go and check on it and collect some data throughout the summer. Um, NCAR is still closed through the summer, so uh, no inside access. But given that the gardens are outside, we'll be able to do that. I know that it might not be the same for everyone. Here, um, the University of Sheffield is not going to establish the garden this year. We work with annual plants and we also work with the local schools. So even though we have the garden at the botanical gardens, which is open to the public, we, we haven't started the seedlings in time and we should have already had all the events organized with the schools by now and the schools are closed. So we decided to not to establish the garden this year, unfortunately. Looking forward for next year. The Avon Lake Public Library just opened to the public um, through a drive through and in two weeks they will be opening interior to the public. So we're going to be able to um, remove the sod and actually grow plants. Um, it, like I said, it was 58 degrees out here. It's just now time to put seeds in. So we will be able to start our garden once you folks give us the seeds. Okay. Okay. On their way. Thank you. Anybody else? This is, yeah, this is Shun Liu. Yeah, I'm a member of the Temple Science team. Uh, I'm sitting with my daughter, Joanna Liu. Yeah, we uh, yeah we are going to start our uh, own garden in our backyard. Yeah, thanks to uh, sis from Erica. Yeah, realize yeah, uh, yeah, it's really exciting to to see also to see the own garden. Yeah, uh, around the country. So uh, yeah, at least maybe we can uh, compare results. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Johnny, you want to say something? Okay. Yeah. So our <coughs> sorry, our snap beans, our beans are growing pretty well. Uh, the milkweed and cutleaf coneflowers are not growing at all. So we might just have beans in our ozone garden. So that's, that's fine. <laughs> it had been a, a week, right? It's been like two weeks, but... Um, a week? Two just weeks. Two, two, one, maybe, two. maybe take some time for the seeds yeah, to germinate. We also uh, started kind of late, so... Yeah, the milkweed seeds are much harder to germinate. Um, and they, they, I feel like they have like a 20% success rate. So about 20% of the seeds that you plant might germinate. Um, 
that are a little harder to grow. The coneflower, I don't have as much experience growing from seed, but I do imagine that sometimes they take a little while to sprout. So, uh -huh, okay, maybe that's normal. Uh -huh. we yeah. just... <laughs> so don't give up on them yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't don't give up on them yet. And if you only have snap beans, that's also great. Uh, I'm Emily from the Virginia Living Museum. Um, we are not expecting to open until about mid-June, but we are expecting to open and I will have a garden. I think this year I'm just gonna focus on milkweed. It's already popping up because it's from an established garden that we've had running in this spot for four years. So all those rhizomes are just already spread and already popping. Um, so we will have public, obviously we're limiting access, you know, trying to do our best safety procedures as well. Um, so we do hope to have a little bit of uh, citizen science. I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but we will have a garden minimally with milkweed starting probably in June. Great. Yeah, if you, I, I think if you wanted to, this is not a requirement, but if you wanted to, you probably could also plant snap beans around that time um, when things open and I bet that they would germinate and grow through the summer. Um, they just have a much shorter time, time frame, um, so they don't need as long to get started and growing. Um, so that's another option if you wanted to add a second plant. It's not necessary, but. Yeah, I've done two growings of snap beans in the garden before, so I can yeah. probably, it just you, also depends on launching everything else at that time too. Um, you know, this is one part of my job. I, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I <don't really laughs> understand. I'm just saying, just if you wanted to, there's no pressure at all, but I think that they, they would do okay if you planted them later. That's all I'd say. Yeah, I could definitely add them to my garden. This is Sarah Dickert and I'm with Smithsonian Gardens. Um, so we have not done an ozone garden before. This was supposed to be our first year. Um, I actually brought some of the snap beans home and I have a few that are sprouting in trays in my backyard. Um, our gardens are technically open all the time that anyone that's walking around the Smithsonian Museums down on the National Mall can walk through our gardens. So in theory, if I have a chance to get them planted, people will be able to see them, but we don't have any signage or anything, so they wouldn't know what they're looking at. Um, however, we as the Smithsonian are um, all working from home, and we don't know when the Smithsonian Museums are going to be opening back up again. So I'm only going into work about once a week, and or once a month, sorry, uh, and that's basically just doing weed maintenance at this point. Um, so if we can, we're going to try to get maybe some stuff in the ground. We can probably get some um, echinacea and asclepias, maybe for, from some like partner gardens or something like that. Um, but not sure if and when it would happen. But I'm still optimistic. <laughs> we might be able to do something or at least get it started for, you know, maybe next year. <laughs> Absolutely. This is Rhea Waldman at the South Dakota Discovery Center. So we are closed right now still, but we have our garden outside and we have an intern that is responsible for gardening because we not only do the ozone, ozone garden, but also vegetables and a pollinator garden. So, um, and since they're outside, um, there's access to that. We're hoping that we'll open up again sometime this summer, but we have no idea yet where we're at. Um, but we'll, we'll hopefully <clears throat> incorporate some of the citizen science and some of our virtual summer camps that we're doing. So we will be growing. The cone flowers are already out. I don't know what happened to the milkweed. I think it was mowed over last year and now it's not happy. <clears throat> and I'm hoping that we'll get the snap beans and um, you know some of the seeds from you and then we'll start that as soon as we have them. Absolutely, yeah. And I think um, doing things virtually, showing folks uh, the leaves from a, a distance, if that's what folks want to do, would be great. Um, we can send seeds home if anybody's uh, wanting to engage their visitors at their sites uh, but isn't going on site. I can try and get some snap bean seeds to your houses as well if that's thing, something people are interested in doing. Um. Yeah, well, it's exciting to hear that some people are potentially trying to grow. Um, and I guess, you know, I, we realize that things are very different this year. And so um, hopefully, hopefully next year we'll be able to grow a little bit more. Um, 
But I also wanted to ask, is there, for those of you who are or who are not growing gardens this year, is there anything else that we can do to support you besides um, trying to get you seeds if you requested them or anything else? So here, University of Sheffield, UK. Um, one of the things that we have here in the UK is that the growing season is very short. So we need to start the, the planting, I mean, all the seedlings, seeding in mid-May and the plants needs to be on the ground by June and with early August, everything pretty much is dry or well, the end of August. So is there, to, in order to get the seeds for next year, is it okay if I email you in January or, or February or so since everything is moving now, is it better to get the seeds now for next year? Yeah, so I have to think about that just because like, as we've discussed, shipping the seeds to England, I just have to work with, there are restrictions on me as a Smithsonian employee for doing that uh, kind of work. Okay. So, um, that just, we have to think that through a little bit. We, we got some three years ago from Jack Friedman, Friedman, which I see that, I think he's in the meeting, from his team, and there was no restriction for snap beans, and we got some meal weeks, but we typically get them from CEH, the Center of Ecology and Hydrology here in the UK, which I think they get them from, from, from you, at least the snap beans, uh, tolerant and the sensitive. But anyway, yeah. we can talk offline. I just wanted to make sure that maybe if we're starting the garden next year, when should I ask for seeds if right. seeds? Yeah, and we'll, we'll try to get that process better dialed down. I feel like we've been um, slowly becoming more and more organized over the past couple of years. But I think as our international gardens start, we do need to figure out better ways of um, I, I, I don't really know the restrictions on shipping seeds. I do know that there are likely some, but I need to look into that a little bit more and start to think okay. about that. And also, I think ultimately, I would love to um, see if I could partner with some, some of the other scientific communities and other regions. And I know some of the folks at um, CEH, but also elsewhere, I, you know, there were some folks that were interested in planting gardens in Belize and also in India, and I just need to figure out what types of plants okay. will grow in those places that won't, yeah, come out of control. You, you guys have really, potato, yeah, you, you have potato, which I haven't been able to, to put potatoes, but I think it would be interesting because we focus on crops. So we have wheat, sensitive wheat, snap beans, and clover. And this all this okay. variety, I mean, this seeds comes from the UK, except the snap beans. But okay. if we can introduce in the garden, in the garden, new yeah. species that that will be interesting actually. Great. Yeah, we'll I'll I'll make that a sort of priority over the next year or several months, I guess, to to see if we can figure out better ways of um, shipping and collaborating internationally, so that so that we can do a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Erica, Jennifer mm -hmm. from Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Did I miss the email that went out with the templates for the signs? No, there, as all of you have been dealing with issues, we too have been dealing with issues. Um, so we have some older signs, but we are just now finally getting our request for proposal out. Um, as I mentioned, Smithsonian Earth Optimism has funded uh, some work and some of that is getting new graphic signs, uh, new designs for signs that any of you can take and manipulate. I can send you the current one, which is not as pretty, um, <laughs> something I made. Uh, so depending on what your time frame is for getting things up, if you're willing to wait a few weeks, hopefully we'll have something even prettier soon. Thank you, we're able to wait. Okay. All right. Well, we're always interested in any other updates, feel free to email Donica and I offline as well with questions or concerns or ways we can help. Um, we're here. But we've got exciting news too. I'll let Donica take it away. Yeah, um, Erica, do you mind if I share my screen so that we can go through the Absolutely. website? Um, yeah, so we have uh, a new website that is live and this is thanks to um we partnered with some undergraduate seniors in the computer 
science department at CU Boulder, and they took this on as their senior practicum project. It was a fun experience. I think for them, they got to learn about design and work for clients, and uh, and they also got to learn about the ozone gardens and ozone damage. And so I think that that was uh, fun for them overall. And I have to thank Erica and Becca helped me a ton with the content. The three of us um, had to spend a, a decent amount of time going through and, and putting together the content for the website. And then Ryan Johnson, who's also on this call, has been a huge help on the NCAR side of things, trying to um, make sure that this website is live and functional and he will be dealing with all of the troubleshooting um, in the future. And so I, um, this, is, this is the overview page for our website. You can see the garden overview, it has a bunch of information. Um, there's, you know, there's drop down menus with uh, a bit more information talking about what ozone is, where it comes from, how it impacts plants and I'm not going to go through all of these because I will um, we can share the link with all of you to to go and explore but you know we have um, information on how it impacts human health how it impacts culture and then things that we can do so these you know these are individual actions we can also monitor it from land and space so this is connecting tempo mission that uh, that are going to talk a little bit about that um, and then a little bit more information on planting ozone gardens so this is um, you know it has some information this links to the National Park Service website with uh, bioindicator species so that if you wanted to plant additional species in your gardens or at home you can um, do that uh, it also gives a little bit of information on finding your nearest EPA ozone monitor and um, a link for folks who are interested in setting up new gardens that haven't talked to us yet. So um, that's you know the overview page and then we've also created a training page. Sorry my internet at home is a little bit slow so uh, it can take a while from the uh, web to switch. Um, I identify ozone damage so they go through and um, here you see that there's we, we go through and describe what the ozone damage looks like and the progression in order. Um, so you're looking for stipple, you're looking for the green leaf veins. You see here. Um, I'm gonna pause and see the brown patches. And so we all of the, it, yep. Um, can everybody see what Donica is talking about? Or is, is she, mine's pretty delayed. My view of what you're talking about is delayed. So I just wanna make oh, okay. Mine was a little bit delayed. Yeah, I think, again, oh, that's okay. my internet. Ryan, I was wondering if maybe Ryan could yeah. present for you and then you could talk. Sure. Ryan, does yeah, that work Ryan, for you? Yeah, that sounds good. I can, uh, I'll share my screen. Sure, I will stop sharing. Yeah, sorry, I live in the, the foothills west of Boulder and so we have slow mountain internet. <laughs> Thanks, Erica, for adding that website. Yeah, of course. All right, can everybody, um, everybody see? Yeah, yeah. All right, um, Donica, I'll just be the pilot if you just want to tell me. Sure, yeah, so we were on the training page and I was just, um, you know, so you will you can go through all of those links for how to identify ozone damage and right, um, yeah, if you wanted to, uh, scroll down a little bit, Ryan. This is the training game. And so this is, um, you know, the, it'll pop up an image and you select yes or no, and it'll tell you if you're correct or incorrect. And so you can sort of go through and quiz yourself on your knowledge of ozone damage. Um, we're still working out a few of the kinks here, uh, but for the most part, you can go through and you can um, you can just test yourself on whether or not you can identify the ozone damage. So, um, yeah, I guess maybe uh, we can go to the next page, Ryan. And again, my my I might be seeing something that's delayed from what the rest of you are seeing, but um, this is the image gallery. So, if you wanted to to just peruse what ozone damage looks like on the different kinds of plants, you can. 
you can look at that. And so this website, I should also say, as Ryan's going through a few of the photos, um, this website is designed to be mobile friendly so that people can uh, go through and collect data and see all of these things on their phone. Um, and so that's part of the reason why we have so many scroll screens and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's examples of no injury and of other types of injury and of ozone injury in this image gallery, um, just from some of the photos that we have so far. Yeah, should we go on to the next page, Ryan, which I think is the data entry page? Um, so if you, uh, you'll see here, there's a map. If you zoom out, you'll also see some the gardens in the UK and one in Norway um, are, are listed on there right now. Um, and so uh, we, have, we have a variety of gardens. Uh, most of our network is still in the United States, but um, you know, there's a bunch of different points and we, so this page, you can select your, you can, you can see where all the different gardens are, but you can also select um, your garden location. And so if you select one of those, so um, Spelman College is what Ryan has selected here, and then you can select a plant type. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to go to NCAR, Ryan, so that we can then wipe the, we can go through the data and, and then just wipe it at the end. Um, yeah, and just choose one of the plants, any of those is fine. And so you see the photos there. Um, and then if you go down here, this is where we will collect the data. And again, this will come up on your phone if you want to be out on your phone and you can just go through and um, select the image um, or the category with ozone damage that you see on the leaf. And so these are um, images, but there's also the range to, um, to sort of give you a sense for what, you know, what that range should be. Um, and so this, this will make data collection a lot easier. You can go through and you can also reference the photo collection as you go. Um, yeah, and then once you're done, you submit. And I think that that should take you to the data visualization page. Um, yeah, and so then you can see the data that you have plotted. Um, and so there's a couple of options here. Uh, we don't current we don't currently have the data um, from previous years in, in this database, but we're working on putting that in. And so these are just data that we um, have made up so far. <laughs> and so you can see the, um, the proportion of leaves that are damaged here. Um, so this is what we just collected is in that second bar on May 22nd. And it gives you the proportion of damage on snap beans. We also have options for you to compare two different locations or two different plant types. Um, and that it, the data will look a little bit different on that, but that this way you can go through and you can actually see the um, progression of ozone damage at the garden and any visitor can see that um, at the gardens. So that's, um, that's the website on, um, in general, we ask that anybody who is as affiliated with the gardens um, to log in, you know, especially if you're the person that's managing the garden, if you don't mind um, logging in, you'll have to initially, you'll have to start by registering. And then, um, and then once you register, otherwise you'll have this email and password pop up. And that way we know um, we can, you know, we can track whether it's a citizen scientist that has collected the data or if it's somebody at the garden. Um, and that, that helps us if you log in so that we can track um, your data collection because then we can we can track one person through time um, which gives us a better indication of uh, what is actually happening through time because there might be some variability or subjectivity in the citizen scientist data and even you know in from from trained professional to trained professional there's going to be some variability but if we can track the same person through time we get a better sense for um, the baseline data that that are being collected and so, um, like I said, you'll initially, everybody will have to register for the ozone garden. And so you'll need to enter just um, a, a bit of information. Um, 
And that is, you know, just your name and your email so that we can be in touch. The institution or the name of where your garden will be. And then you enter a password so that you can log in every time. And then we ask for the um, garden details, like the, the street address of the garden, so that we can add it to the map correctly. Um, what's on the map so far is just me going through Google Maps and uh, picking out a latitude and longitude of where I think your garden is. And so <laughs> if you give us the street address, we can make that a little more accurate on the map. And then um, because we don't want uh, we don't want people to sort of maliciously enter tons and tons of information. This this step uh, will say that your registration is pending and it'll send me an email and then I can approve the garden location, which hopefully should be um, pretty quick to do. So if you can do this, you know, sooner rather than later, you'll always have that same log on um, and you won't have to do this again. And that way um, there's no delay if you decide that you want to go out and start collecting data. Um, so that's a just a quick whirlwind tour of the the website. Um, there's a lot of time and energy that went into preparing this, and I'm sure that there will still be things um, that we need to work on. We do have a wish list of additional um, things that we'd like to add, additional features that we'd like to add. But uh, you know, we're <laughs> we have the the basic stuff done, and so I think that that will be helpful to start. Um, and I will say that if you run into any problems with the website or have any suggestions, please don't hesitate to let us know and we'll do our best to address those as well. Um, so I guess before we move on, are there any questions about the website or any um, thoughts, anything that pops into mind right away? Danica, this is Emmy. I have a question. Um, yeah. Are we okay to use the pictures from the uh, pho photo gallery and other things. What's the copyright on those? Sure. Yeah, um, if you would like to use those, uh, it, I feel like a lot of them are photos that Ryan and I took or that um, Erica, yeah. I don't know if you took them or your yeah, intern. Your right intern, so. Right, so I'm happy for, for folks to use those. Um, you know, I mean, if you wanted to put a link to the website, you can, um, but I, I'm, you know, from my perspective, I don't, I don't mind anybody using those photos. Yeah, of the leaves, I don't feel like we need any mention of copyright, yeah. specific copyright for these. They're well, thank you. It, it just looks like a great and intuitive website. I'm really excited. Great, great thanks. Me too. <laughs> All right, do you want me to switch it back to you, Erica? That would be great. Yeah, um, when, as they're switching them back, one thing that I, um, in, in my wish list of things to add, I would love to have a photo of the different gardens to go with those locations. Um, you know, that's not something that we have the capability of doing right now, but I think that that would be a fun way for people to be able to see location as well. So maybe that's something that we can add, especially as you um, are growing your gardens and have images to send to us. John, a question. Erica, yes. Uh, just for clarification, so one person is going to register per garden, and then um, the people who are going to be uploading the database are they to use our name when they, they don't have they don't have to register at all. No, yeah, you don't have to register in order to collect data, um, and you can have more than one person register per garden if you want to. But um, we like we need probably one person from each garden to register. But if, you know, if you're working with somebody else, um, Jennifer, that's also managing the gardens, um, you know, we can probably add another person as a manager. Yeah. So but we have the school environmental classes. They will be changing from year to year, but so far the contract for the environmental teacher, she's on for the next five years. So that will be stable and be a new one, but they will continue. Yeah program because they have approved it to the school district to add it to the curriculum. So Great. we do have people who will be doing it, but they will be changing from time to time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that, Go ahead. Um, I was just saying that was one of our goals with not only having one registered person and then no one else has to register is because we do know these are in public places that 
somebody might want to stop by and participate in the citizen science and there's to reduce that barrier of having to create an account you know how annoying it is creating all these accounts that somebody can show up do a quick training and participate in that citizen science yeah and the main reason for um for one person to register the garden is just so that we have a point of contact for that garden um, that's that's actually the main reason and you know in our database right now we have all of the existing gardens that I'm aware of um, but even still you know it'll be nice to have somebody who is registered connected with those gardens you know so that if we need to send out network emails for some reason or if there's you know if we see something that is interesting we can can let you know and I think that that's um, just a good way to have somebody connected to the actual garden that we can get in touch with. Okay, so now I want to, we're, I know we're all excited about the new website and sharing, uh, but we have some guests today and so I want to make sure we leave time for all of our guests. So we have a short presentation um, from Kat Poots next, who's part of the Smithsonian Earth Optimism team. Uh, and I'll let her take it away. And I know at some point I'm going to share a video, but let you yeah, I just, I'll be very brief so we can get on to the um, bigger talks, but I want to introduce myself first, and I'm Kat Kutz. I manage communications for Smithsonian's Earth Optimism Initiative, uh, which supports us. And my background personally is in science communication, and particularly for conservation. So I'm very passionate about Earth Optimism and what we're doing, and more than excited to share. Um, a little bit of background on what Earth Optimism is first is a movement and an event. And the idea actually first came up from a marine scientist, Nancy Knowlton, who felt that her field uh, was just giving all of this public facing narrative that was more like obituaries for the ocean rather than the exciting, cool things that were going on. And it's very depressing, demotivating. And she realized that something really needed to change. So she created this movement, which has since been adopted by both the Smithsonian and Cambridge Conservation Initiative. They're our close partner. And we went into this mission knowing that it can be incredibly paralyzing to people if we want to empower them, but all we're doing is talking about what's going wrong. And you might have heard of some of these terms like ecological depression and climate anxiety, anxiety and that's stem from feeling like there's no hope. So Earth Optimism exists to change that. And we want people to see that there are solutions and not just on the large scale, like a national park being created, but solutions that anyone can be a part of. So whether it's conserving backyard biodiversity or improving air quality, these are the kind of solutions that we wanna highlight. And we also wanna highlight the people behind them. So we do this mostly through uh, the global conversation on social media through our hashtag Earth Optimism and through the Earth Optimism Summit, which just took place Earth Week. That was April 22nd, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And we were able to gather hundreds of change makers from all over the world and talk about their success stories. So we also support projects like this, and we want to make you all feel empowered to get involved with Earth Optimism. So I encourage everyone to follow us on social media, join in, use hashtag Earth Optimism when you're promoting your gardens, and you can find more resources on our website. We have an open online course that I would recommend taking if you're kind of new to social media, and that's under our website, earthoptimism.si.edu. I can share that in the chat. And under there is Smithsonian resources, so there's the online program, there's a few other resources that the Smithsonian has helped us gather that I would definitely recommend looking into. And then, of course, there's me. I'm here and I'm happy to help in any way I can. So if you have any questions about how to communicate about what you're doing, please feel free to reach out. Um, I can be reached through email. You can even message me on social media. I keep those channels open. So if you see something that we're doing and you want to know how to utilize that, feel free to send me a message. Um, and then if we have time today, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about what we're doing. Um, but then I also have just a short video I wanted to share that kind of gives a nice glossy overview of what Earth Optimism is trying to accomplish and how to get involved. Great. I will pull that up and share the screen, see if I can 
do this okay. All right. I'm gonna keep it small because I'm worried I'll lose my <laughs> Zoom if I don't. Uh, can you hear that? Mm A great little video. Um, thank you, Kat. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, well, it's it's exciting to um to see and to know that movement. And I just I this might come up a little bit later on, but I wanted to let everybody know also in thinking about this positively that ozone concentrations have actually decreased quite a bit since the 1950s. And so that's I always try to emphasize that positive side of the story. We still have a long way to go, but um, yeah, there are good things. So keep that. I like that optimism approach. Absolutely. Keep that in mind. Um, and so we'll, we'll share the link to the Earth Optimism page in the chat as well. And so speaking of optimism, we can't fix the problems that we don't know about. And so we have to have a better understanding of what's going on with our ozone. Uh, so today we're going to hear from two of our Tempo team members, Caroline Nolan and Gonzalo gonzalez Avad, And they're going to tell us a little bit about the history of air quality, what we're, what we know, how we're studying it, and a little bit about the Tempo mission. Caroline, if you want to take it away, or Gonzalo, I'm not sure who's talking first. I think I go first. Yeah, just uh, one question, Erica. How much uh, time do we have? When is this? I know we're we're running a lot later than I had planned. Um, <laughs> we had this website took a little longer, which is totally worth it for us. Um, it's up to you two. I don't know how much long if you guys can stay. Late. I know we had planned on having you guys talk for a little longer. I'm fine to stay late. Just wondering how fast to go through the <laughs> slides for everybody else. <laughs> Is everybody okay staying a little late today? Yes, I am. <laughs> right. And we are recording it. So um, for those of you that can't stay late, we'll share the recording afterwards. Thanks everyone for that understanding. <laughs> so hi. <clears throat> uh, as Erika says, I'm Gonzalo, and I work on the Tempo team, uh, mostly doing uh, retrievals of uh, trace gases. But uh, she asked me if we could talk a bit about Tempo, and Caroline and I decided to split the talk in two parts. The first one, which is the one I'm doing, is kind of an introduction, and then Caroline will talk more about, I guess, Tempo. But I didn't know who I was talking to, so... In, in a pure Gonzalo fashion, I guess I have gone out of topic. But anyway, let's just see if you enjoy it. And if you think uh, I should skip through the slides, you just let me know. I will not be feeling bad. <laughs> so I decided to go with uh, uh, an outline that for my part that will be like, what do we, what is about air pollution? Yeah, the history and what is behind it so let's let's go in, in into into the presentation and try to keep it slightly or as short as possible i put too much slide too many slides i realize now anyway air pollution now we are very worried about it but this is nothing new it has been going on since i will say there is life in the earth yeah 
because uh, or before that even yeah when we were had at the beginning fires on the volcanoes it's the same things that we are trying to fight now or at least part of them anyway uh, before the industrial revolution there was already signs of uh, pollution and actually some people didn't like it so much so since things seneca uh, had a writing uh, about leaving the fumes of Rome, something like in the year 46 of our era. So that the, the guy was upset with the air quality in Rome, the beginning of the of our uh, uh, era. So there is a very interesting paper, uh, paper no more, more an article in the Smithsonian Magazine. It was published in 2016. That kind of goes through this uh, evolution. And then since I'm Spaniard, I wanted to illustrate it with a, I, this is an amazing painting, I think so. If you ever have the opportunity to travel again abroad, you can go to Madrid and then uh, in El Prado, you can have this, the, the Prado is a great museum, but one of the paintings I like a lot is this one uh, from Diego Velázquez, which uh, it shows the, the god Volcano, that's the guy on the left. Uh, and then the forgers uh, making weapons. Uh, anyway, the point of this is that all these activities uh, were already releasing uh, heavy metals or other stuff into the atmosphere well before uh, we started to be so concerned about pollution. But it was already documented. Uh, however, things really started to change uh, with the Industrial Revolution. So I have put here three plots from that's all the killing curve for CO2. Uh, so this one starts 800,000 years ago. You see there has been always variations. Uh, but if you look at the line close to zero, present day, that's what we are doing today. Um, there is no doubt that we have done something. And CO2 is not what is our main concern, but it's a nice tracer for I will say human activity. So then I went and pick up the plot for the last 10,000 years. Uh, and well, we could discuss or not. I, I'm not an expert on these things. What was going on before uh, the before the you know the, the the coming of the human civilization? But what we can see definitely is that since I will say maybe 1773. You want, you want to put a year, uh, things have gone really, really, really um, bad in terms of air quality and pollution in the world. So these plots, oh, I forgot to say, in all these plots, all the data before 1958 is from my scores. Um, the bubbles of uh, CO2 trap in the ice cores. Data after that is from NOAA, at their measurements in Mauna Loa. In, is it Hawaii? Maybe. Uh, Yulaea, I think so. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to illustrate how things have been progressing and how things have speed up in the last uh, five to six decades. But actually, starting with the Industrial Revolution, the trend did change very quickly. So I wanted to show some pictures of nasty things going on. So this is a picture from the huge smog they had in London, I think it's 1950. It says 1952, but uh, I thought it was 1953. I may be wrong. Anyway, I think they, they think 4,000 people died because of this smog episode. Uh, the next picture is from Los Angeles. I didn't know this one, but it turns out that I, I think it's interesting. So this was during the Second World War. And uh, I read... Uh, some articles saying that um, many Los Angeles citizens thought it was a Japanese attack. But then no, it turns out that it was themselves attacking themselves. Uh, and then this is more recent, yeah? This is an example of Van Gogh. But we can see all these things everywhere. Uh, in Madrid, for example, we had this problem. And uh, one thing that uh, Velázquez and Goya, they all like to paint was, is the sky of Madrid because of all this red uh, tones that we get in the in the sunsets, but uh, yeah, they are beautiful. But sometimes they are not uh, so healthy. Anyway, 
I don't know who I was talking to, so I decided to put here three uh, websites where you can see current air quality. Um, so it's interesting if I click on these links or you all know these pages already. I think some of our audience knows and some of our audience doesn't, right? We're a pretty broad spectrum of participants in our ozone garden network from people like Donna Kahuna is a ton and to some of our newer uh, museum folks who are still learning. So there's maybe you want to show us one of them. Um, okay, so I, I click on this one. Can you see, has it changed or no. you have the presentation? You're, we're still in your presentation. Okay, I change the screen. Sorry about that. So this, oop. This one uh, shows measurements that are happening now or recently, within the last day. Uh, and these are in situ measurements. In, and what this shows is a, a quality index. I actually have another slide later on about what is the air quality index, which actually is not the same everywhere. Uh, but let's just say that uh, when the number is high, things are not so good. And, uh, these things, uh, this this, uh, this this website, this is not the only one, collects data that is publicly available and just puts in the kind of a Google Maps uh, platform and you can hover over, hover over each one of these stations and see how things are going. So this is one of the, this is one of, of the websites I wanted to, to share. If you don't mind, I will share I will not share uh, the last one, which I think is very interesting, but I will share the one in the middle very quickly because this one is a website that the, our colleagues at Goddard put together um, recently. I think it came online maybe a month ago or something like that. And they are trying to look at the effects of uh, the effects nor how the fact that we are staying at home because of the COVID, things are different than they used to be. So I don't know. Uh, I've, I've mentioned Madrid three times already. So maybe I should go somewhere in the UK. So Maria is closer to Maria. Uh, so oh, another one. There is some, it's, I guess each time I open a file, I need the, a website I need to share again, yeah? Oui. So can you see now the data for Birmingham? Yep. So, okay. Uh, here is, this is this is data from OMI. This is an instrument that has been up there for a long time. It was uh, launched in 2004. It's still working. Now we have better things, uh, but uh, it's still useful. So you see my pointer? Yes. Okay, so the plot on the left, the map on the left, uh, shows the UK. Where is my mouse now? That's Birmingham. Uh, where I'm now, that's May 11th, 2020. On the right is May 11th for the period between 2015 and 2019. So that's how much things have changed because people is staying at home. And this is an image that is showing NO2, which is one of the uh, compounds that play a huge role in the production of ozone and the generation of smoke. I have one couple of slides later on about that. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is, I think, a very nice page uh, if you want to know what is going on in parts of the world. Uh, the one in the middle is the NASA air quality page that is also the, the one in the, 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 the latest one, but in terms uh, to be faster, I'm going to skip that one. So as I was talking, there is better things up there now. This is an image from Tropomi. It's an average from April to September 2018. Tropomi is another instrument. This one was launched by ESA uh, two years ago, to 20, at the end of 2017. And again, this is a plot of NO2 um, showing troposphering column. This is a uh, 
because the NO2 has a short lifetime and uh, it is it, it's a very good it's, it's, it's very and it's easy to measure. We can make these nice plots where you can see cities or you can see shipping lines. If you look at where I'm hovering now, that's that's the result of a, a maritime transport of goods. Um, if I was going to, if I could zoom into parts of the U.S., for example, you will be able to see uh, highways and stuff like that. So this is a global picture that we can obtain from satellites. We cannot do this with the previous, uh, with what I saw first, yeah, the, the in-situ measurements. The in-situ measurements are more accurate but these uh, satellite observations provide uh, very compelling images and information everywhere. And here, another example. This one should change, yeah. So this is, a, this is also from Tropomia. And this is, again, the same thing I was showing for the UK. This is showing it for most of Europe, before and after, well, not before and after. This is uh, where we, it, it flips between 2019 and 2020. Uh, and these are the concentration levels for NO2. And well, it's just an image that shows how dramatically has, things have changed, but also allows us to have a, in this case, regional picture of the situation. Again, this is tropomy data. So, uh, Pollution is uh, generated in a by local uh, in in a in a region in a in some location, but then um, to generate that we have emissions that can be of anthropogenic origin or it can be also natural origin. You know, fires or plants trying to cope with extreme temperatures or many other. Uh, processes, but there is also the fact that they can, uh, the human activities have uh, produced a lot of uh, residues that we throw directly on the air. And those, all those emissions uh, together with sun, light, and other um, um, yeah, with, with sunlight, they, they, they can, we, we get into, the, we get these melting pots of these reactions that uh, help to create uh, what I will move on later on, which we call smog, photochemical smog. But that doesn't stay where it is created. Uh, we have uh, winds and, there, and these things, these particles, these molecules that are in the air get transported. Uh, around the world and then if we have no rain then eventually some of them come down to the earth and get deposited deposit again on a different place a different ecosystem have been affected but by what was done a few thousand kilometers away or even farther away and if we have rain actually rain uh, through wet deposition is a very efficient mechanism to get rid of a lot of things and get them down to the earth. So for example, this is plot that I'm showing now shows the uh, the deposition of uh, nitrate ion in the US in 2001. You can get all these maps from uh, the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. I think they, they've done a great job on making these very compelling images. Actually, there is not so many stations to measure, but they, they have a very good uh, creating and interpolation mechanisms. So point is that you may have, of course, closer to the point of emission, you have higher concentrations and you have higher deposition, but things get transported everywhere and very far away you will get also pollutants. Uh, so for example, to make it into a, to be more complain about how, how this transport thing uh, works is this is an image from mm, that is created with data from MODIS 
Well, this is another sensor in a, NASA, in a couple of NASA satellites. And actually, this one is not looking at NO2. This is looking at uh, aerosols. But what it illustrates is that you may have a ton of fires in, uh, in Asia, uh, and the pollution that is generated there will cross the Pacific and reach the US. And on the other side, you can have also a flow from the North American continent towards Europe. Or if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you actually, we, we get a lot of dust and, uh, from Africa that gets transported across the Atlantic and reaches uh, South America. So yes, uh, if we look, for example, I wanted to show an image, uh, if not on this one, uh, of how mm, concentration of NO2 and SO2 have declined in the US over the last two decades. And these images we can show because of OMI. Uh, part of that is because we have implemented regulations to control emissions. But most of it is because production has been offshore to other countries, mostly China. And yes, while locally there is an improvement, the fact that there is no boundaries in the sky uh, makes the problem not disappear, even if you don't see it directly. And eventually it will come back to us. So um, after all, after showing a bit of uh, what is the, you know, the big picture, a uh, couple of slides about why we care. This one is from the World Health Organization, 2016 uh, deaths due to air pollution. This is an estimate, of course. Uh, so they, they, they estimated it at 4.2 million. Um, we will see what COVID does in a year, just to put it in a scale. Uh, so big trouble, big, big, big problem in terms of human health. But it's not the only consequence. Uh, in this one, in this other plot, I'm showing data from a paper from 2011 that illustrates the reduction in crop yields due to ozone uh, damage in a couple, in three uh, different crops: soybean, maize, and wheat. So the first row is for soybean, second one is for maize, and the third one is for wheat. Where we have red colors, the reduction of uh, yield is huge. If you have a blue color or something like that, uh, it's not so bad. And the difference between the two columns is has to do with the with the model they use uh, to simulate the 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 ozone uh, concentration. You know the not the model the 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 indicator they use. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to show this one because ozone gardens, their goal is to show the damage that ozone has on crops, but actually that translates directly in something as important as food security. If we look at the last plot of India, I mean, India is, yeah, the, the amount of, the amount of people living in India and the need for uh, having a huge loss in the crop yields due to, product, to, to pollution can generate huge socioeconomic troubles and geopolitical instabilities. Uh, so we need to do something about it. Um, and since we want to do something about it, this has been done this has been known for many times. I think someone can correct me probably, uh, but I think the, the first uh, time that there was a, a law in the US to put control on emissions and regulate uh, co valid concentrations was in the 1970 with the, we call it the Clean Air Act or something like that. Uh, but anyway, this, the, the thresholds has been, have been changing over time. Um, this is what the uh, EPA uh, regulates now. So they regulate a few uh, com uh, compounds or um, particles. So the things that we have to take care of are carbon monoxide or that we have to take care of, no, the things that are regulated. Carbon monoxide, lead, nitrogen dioxide, you know, particular matter or 
10 and PN 2.5. That means uh, particles that are smaller than 10 microns or smaller than 2.5 microns, ozone and sulfur dioxide. And then uh, for each one of these in this table, you can see, I'm not going to go through it, but you can see uh, the standard, which is tells you kind of the concentration that you can have. And then if, with, during which period of time, the third column, you have to have, to, you have to comply with those uh, levels. So based on this, uh, the EPA uh, has developed the air quality index, which tries to take into account all these uh, regulations and thresholds um, uh, make them into one single number. So it's easier for the people to uh, know how the air quality is uh, somewhere at a given time uh, without having to know the values for all those things. So similar to the colors that were shown in the map I saw with the in-situ measurements, uh, green is good purple or violet, I don't know what that is, is uh, so bad, it's quite bad. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click here so we can see what is going on uh, right now. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, so this is the, this is what, uh, the current air quality and the forecast from the EPA shows now. And actually, this website, Air Now, Air Now is very interesting also. If you need to talk about air quality to people, I think this is a good resource. Uh, so, going back to my presentation, there is the EPA and then uh, to finish, I want to finish soon. I mean, I don't know how long I've been talking, probably far too long already. A bit of ozone. So ozone in the stratosphere is kind of good. It protects us from the UV radiation and allows life in the planet. When the, we have plenty of ozone in the troposphere, it's like a, acts as a greenhouse gas, so it has an impact on climate. Uh, then in the middle troposphere, we have like the back ozone, and then the ozone that we have in the boundary layer is the one that we are trying to control. That's the ozone as a pollution, uh, you know, affects our health, the plants, and everything else. So, how do you get ozone down in the boundary layer? You have emissions, as I was saying before, from nature and from our activities. You have emissions of uh, nitrogen compounds and volatile organic compounds. Uh, things like isoprene or other uh, LM, uh, other compounds that can be emitted by plants or by industries, and you have transport. And when all this gets the, with in the presence of light, uh, these things react together uh, to form ozone, and down the stream of reactions, you generate secondary pollutants that sometimes have longer lifetimes, so they can be transported uh, farther away. I had next slide with some equations. But uh, probably uh, I can skip this one. Uh, it kind of tries to go through what I've talked in this uh, about this process, but uh, uh, you know, with a bit of uh, chemistry. But I don't think is I don't think is necessary. I think for the sake so, of time today, we can skip this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, to finish, how we measure? So all this was an introduction. Actually, Caroline is going to talk about the instruments we use. But how I see myself is like the same thing that uh, criminal investigators try to do to catch uh, people that does bad things using fingerprints or DNA. We try to do to measure uh, compounds in the atmosphere. So there is a lot of different techniques, but basically all are reduced to the same. Each compound, each molecule, each particle has a property that is intrinsic to it. And if we are capable of find a way of measuring it, then we can quantify it. So I listed here some techniques. Uh, some of them are in situ. Some of them uh, can be applied uh, 
uh, in remote sensing. So the first one, I, I, I'm just gonna, I, I don't think I have to, you can read them. Uh, um, the one we care the most in the Tempo team is light spectroscopy, which basically uses the spectra from molecules. Uh, and in the plot in the needle here, you can see uh, how the spectra in the atmosphere looks like. Uh, so let's look at the red line. That's if you have clouds. And because you have clouds, your signal is much higher. So it's easier to distinguish. Um, so in all these wiggles, information about all these molecules that are written there and even more is codified. And our job is to go there and try to extract that information. The blue boxes here, these uh, blue lines, those are the areas where Tempo is going to be measuring. And I think with this, I pass it on to Caroline, if nobody has a question or, I don't know. Yeah, this is Caroline. Maybe let's save the questions for the end of this. Sure. I, I'll, uh, I, I'll share my own screen, um, if you can stop, Gonzalo. I did. OK, thanks. Can you see it now? Yes. My screen? OK. All right. Um, all right. Thanks for the introduction, Gonzalo. So um, yeah, so of the, the techniques that Gonzalo was just talking about, the one that we are interested in is remote sensing. So I'll just give a little bit of an introduction and then get into some specifics about what we're doing. Um, so remote sensing observations use light to sense the atmosphere remotely. So we don't have to be sort of at the location of the pollution to measure it. Um, and they can be either active. So in that case, um, the instrument would provide the light, so the light source, like for instance, a laser, or passive where we use a light source from, from something else. So typically in our kind of observations, this is the sun. Um, and, and these kind of instruments can be put on lots of different platforms. So they can be on a satellite. Um, and, and that's mostly what we focus on the middle. Um, the middle image here is um, called a Pandora instrument, and this is one that we have on a building at Harvard. And it's a remote sensing instrument that uses similar techniques to the satellite instruments that we use, but it's placed on the ground and it looks upwards instead of down from space. And so we can measure the total amount of different gases in the column of air above that instrument. Um, and then here is an aircraft that um, we've, we've had an instrument on, which is, again, similar to um, the tempo instrument, but it's um, we can place it on the underside of an aircraft and fly over like a city or something and map that that region. So um, there's lots of different geometries and how you can you can set up a remote sensing instrument or how a satellite instrument can can uh, measure from space. But the kind that, of geometry that we use um, is in these kind of measurements is called um, um, nadir backscatter. And so um, it's the, typically the best way to look at pollution that's close to the surface. So in this case, we have solar light in the ultraviolet visible and near infrared that comes into the atmosphere and it's reflected or scattered off um, the surface as well as clouds in the atmosphere and molecules in the atmosphere. And what we do um, typically is use a satellite to take um, a spectrum of the sun without the atmosphere in the way and then we look down and look at the atmosphere and then in this column um, of air that the solar light passes through um, certain wavelengths of light are absorbed so Gonzalo showed that um, spectrum a few slides ago with the fingerprint basically we're looking for the fingerprint of the molecule in that spectrum and then we can derive, that's what Gonzalo and I actually spend most of our lives doing, um, is deriving the amount of different gases um, or aerosols in that light path. So um, I think Gonzalo, he touched on this um, already, but why, why we use satellite observations um, when we have already have surface observations. Um, basically, this, the in situ or surface observations that we have, they can provide concentrations as a function, function of time at one single location. So um, this is an example plot uh, from a colleague, Jeff Geddes at Boston University, um, that was just in the news last week. And this is a, um, a line plot showing nitrogen dioxide concentrations at the surface in, at the Kenmore Square location in Boston. And uh, 
this is an interesting one because it, it shows NO2 as a function of hour of day um, on April weekdays in 2016 to 19. Those are the thin red lines, but it also shows what it looked like this year in 2020. So due to the COVID-19 um, uh, shutdowns, you can see it's reduced a lot. However, that's just one location. So if you look at all the NO2 um, surface observations uh, in the EPA network in the US, this is, this is them on a map. Looks like there's quite a few compared to some parts of the world, but some states like Idaho, for instance, has one. Um, and even when you zoom into a location like um, where we live in the east coast of, or the northeast of the United States, you'll look at Massachusetts, there's actually just maybe four, four to six monitors in the Boston area. And so something like NO2 can actually change on the scale of blocks, um, city blocks. So even if you get, um, have, of several observations in a city, it's um, not necessarily representative of the um, urban or the distribution of, of that pollutant in an urban area. But satellites can cover the globe. Um, so current satellites, air quality satellites that are up are, are in low Earth orbit. So that's about 700 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And, um, and so they can make, we can make these beautiful maps of, of pollution, but they actually these kind of orbits, they typically only would pass over one location, or sorry, a certain location once per day. Also, if that location is cloudy, we can't actually measure below the clouds using this technique. Um, however, if you put a satellite into a geostationary orbit, which is exactly at 35,786 kilometers above the, uh, um, the Earth, then the a uh, satellite will orbit the Earth with the same period as the rotation of the Earth um, if it's over the equator. And so you can basically have a satellite that essentially is kind of hovering over the same location on the Earth. And so it gives a possibility to see the same scene all day long. So uh, you're probably familiar with images from other satellites that are in geostationary orbit, um, which are weather sat a lot of weather satellites. Um, and so if you see like an image of a hurricane, um, crossing through the Atlantic. Um, those are often images that come from a geostationary weather satellite. And there's also a lot of communication satellites in these orbits. However, until this year, there haven't been any of um, uh, our air quality satellites in this orbit. So this is about to change. Um, there's a, this is a, a picture showing, again, nitrogen dioxide, um, which makes some of the nicest maps uh, over the globe with showing the fields of view of, um, of, or sorry, fields of regard of three different instruments. The GEMS instrument over Asia actually just launched a couple of months ago. So they're in a, a commissioning phase right now. Um, so we haven't seen any results from that, but hopefully it'll be coming in the next few months. Sentinel-4 is being launched by the European Space Agency in a couple of years. And then TEMPO over North America, which most of you have at least heard something about, um, is, is being launched or being run out of our group at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and uh, funded by, by NASA. So TEMPO stands for Tropospheric Emissions Monitoring of Pollution. Here's a picture of it. It is currently in storage in a clean room in Boulder, Colorado at Ball Aerospace, um, as far as I know. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a joint NASA Smithsonian mission, but with participation from lots of, of different institutes in the US, Canada, Mexico, Cuba, um, and then some other collaborators from around the globe. The PI is Kelly Chance at the SAO, and the deputy PI, who's actually on this telecon, because he and his daughter are uh, planting an ozone garden in there um, at their own home, Sean, um, uh, is here. And it's planned for launch in mid-2022 by SpaceX. It's going up on a commercial satellite. So this is one of the first times that NASA is putting one of its instruments on a, a commercial satellite instead of um, on its own satellites. This shows um, how tempo, the kind of measurements in tempo will make in one hour. So uh, tempo um, is pointing its optics at North America and then it, it collects observations in a scan. So it starts over the East Coast um, of, of North America and then it scans to the West Coast usually once an hour. There's a possibility in some cases if there's something really interesting going on, like say a forest fire 
in the Western US or the, what, there's some particular experiment that scientists have proposed to say, look at um, nitrogen emissions from fertilizer applications, say, then they can take the instrument and point it at a, a smaller section of North America and just scan back and forth maybe every 10 minutes. So you can get really high um, time resolution observations. So the spatial resolution is a lot better than most of the instruments. Well, pretty much all the instruments that are currently in space, but really one of the revolutionary things is the temporal resolution. So instead of having one observation a day over New York City, now we'll have um, one every hour from dawn until dusk. So I'll just, this is a, there's a lot of text on here. Um, but uh, I just wanted to mention specifically what we measure that's relevant to air quality. So of course we measure ozone, which many of you are interested in, um, nitrogen dioxide, um, which is primarily produced by fossil fuel burning, but also emissions from soils and lightning. And uh, none of these are, are separated from each other. You need um, NOx and VOCs to make ozone. Um, and some of these are also precursors to particulate matter that we measure. Um, so as a package, they, they help us to understand um, other molecules and the processes that are involved in, in, um, in those chemical mechanisms as well. Sulfur dioxide, that's actually something that's um, getting harder and harder to measure over the U.S. because of the success of uh, air quality controls, but this primarily comes from um, uh, volcanoes volcanic emissions, so we don't have control over that, but uh, also from burning of fossil fuel and smelting of ores. Uh, formaldehyde and glyoxal are things that we, VOCs we can measure. They're not, um, there are lots of volatile organic compounds in the atmosphere, but they don't necessarily have a spectral signature at the wavelengths of light that we observe. So a lot of people will use, um, say, formaldehyde in a, a chemical transport model of the atmosphere to infer the um, volatile organic compound emissions um, that are happening because formaldehyde is a molecule that happens in a chain of chemical reactions. They can then use that to constrain emissions of other gases. We can measure clouds um, and also um, aerosols and like dust and particulate matter and, and particulate matter, um, some of the smallest particulate matter is actually um, what is most highly correlated with mortal premature mortality. So that has important implications for health. So these can be used in a variety of applications, which are very um, wide. And this is just a, a very short list, but of course, um, air quality and health studies. So um, like looking at short-term exposure to ozone or particulate matter, as well as chronic exposure. People are interested in looking at pollution from oil and gas fields, at um, nitrogen emissions from fertilizer, um, at solar-induced fluorescence, um, and um, looking at plant uh, productivity as well, um, crop and plant damage from ground level ozone, which of course is um, the ozone gardens are, are most connected to, ultraviolet expo exposure because we measure UV light, and um, biomass burning emissions. This is some of the maps of the kind of simulated tempo data that, that we're retrieving. So the top one is um, surface ozone, um, and then uh, the bottom two are, are nitrogen dioxide. You can see um, plumes coming out of forest fires here, as well as um, some urban pollution power plants in Los Angeles, power plants in different parts of the United States, Mexico City down here, um, and formaldehyde. And in this particular case, it, it's um, primarily showing up in this region as a product of um, isoprene um, uh, production from for heat stress forests. So um, just to close, I, I wanted to say one other new thing that's come out of, or that will come out of TAMPO um, are, is an advancement in how we measure ozone in the atmosphere. So many of you are probably familiar with um, plots like this, figures with, like this one on the left. Uh, this is the Antarctic ozone hole on one day in 2016 in October. This is from an instrument called OMI. Um, and uh, these kind of uh, ozone hole maps have been made for decades from from uh, instruments measuring in the ultraviolet. Um, as our algorithms and instruments have advanced, that we've been able to measure lower atmosphere ozone. So that's not ozone in the stratosphere or the ozone layer anymore, but rather ozone in the lower 10 kilometers. But typically we can't get any more than one piece of information out of those observations. So this, this is lower tropospheric ozone over the planet. However, 
tempo. I don't have time to go into the details of this. Um, it's fairly complicated, but uh, Tempo adds a wavelength channel in its observations, um, and this wavelength channel allows the um, the instrument instrument's observations to basically penetrate deeper into the atmosphere. And so, as well as measuring lower atmosphere ozone and stratospheric ozone, we will also be able to observe near surface ozone. So that's in the lower you know, couple kilometers of the atmosphere, and that's what's most relevant for um, the uh, ozone. Uh, um, sorry, ozone uh, garments. So I'll just end there. These are a whole lot of institutions that are involved in Tempo, and thanks for your time and staying late. Thank you, Caroline and Gonzalo. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for staying late, um, but I think it was worth it. I think for many of our gardens, there's um, new people learning more and more about ozone. So although many of us have a good background, many of us are still learning and kind of getting a better understanding of how ozone, how we study ozone, what its impacts are. So we really appreciate that. Um, and I think just to bring it back for a quick second to our earth optimism, because um, it does sound scary, all, here's all the problems, but the more we can measure, like you show, the better we can understand the problem, the better we can um, quantify it, the better we can control it. And I think that's one of the, positive impacts of building an instrument like this and our ozone gardens is the better we have an understanding the positive impact we can make on regulations, on our own personal uh, choices. As you showed, there's all those incredible graphs of how different air quality um, has been over this past two months because we're all staying home. And so I think that's really empowering to say, you know, we've all been staying home and what a drop that's been in some of this pollution that we can now think about what choices can I make in the future? Yes, I'm not always going to be staying home like this, but how can I make my own personal choices to have that same impact? Yeah, I'll, I, I will echo everything that you just said. And thank you to Carolyn and Gonzalo for presenting a little bit more about the ozone and how we're measuring it. And I just wanted to um, connect those measurements back to the gardens because right now, a lot of our gardens um, don't have ozone monitors that are necessarily nearby. You know, as Carolyn pointed out, they're still pretty sparse. Um, even the EPA measurements, because those sensors are, are somewhat expensive. If you're interested in purchasing a sensor for your garden, we um, am happy to point you to more resources and to tell you what I've been doing here at NCAR. But also with the launch of Tempo, uh, we'll have a much better idea of what the ozone concentrations are at all of our gardens just because of that spatial resolution and also that temporal resolution because um, ozone does change very much hourly. The highest concentrations tend to peak in the mid to late afternoon, which is also when the plants are taking up the most CO2 and therefore can also take up the most ozone concentrations at those peak times when um, I'm really looking forward to the launch of the Tempo mission because I do think that it will connect better to damage to our gardens and also to what we're breathing and the impacts that it, ozone can be having on humans. Um, so yeah, thank you for those presentations and also for the earth optimism because I do think, like I said earlier, we have our ozone concentrations have declined in the United States due to the Clean Air Act. We still have a long way to go and I think that Tempo is going to sort of revolutionize how we think about that because as Carolyn pointed out, there's some states like Idaho and Nevada that have only one ozone monitor. And so that will allow us to, to have a better understanding in, in spatial distribution, what the um, values are. So thanks. Um, so I know we've kept everybody well over time, but if anybody has one, or, one question or two questions they wanna ask, I'm happy to stay on for another minute. Um, but also feel free to drop off if you've got other meetings to get to. Can I make a quick announcement? Absolutely. Yeah, so NADP, the National Atmospheric Deposition Program that makes that nice national map that Gonzalo showed, had their meeting last week. And one of the chemists who helps makes those maps announced that they're gonna start making ozone maps like that for the ozone W126 at the national level. So that should be available sometime in the next year or so. And, and when those maps are online, and they'll just be on the, on the public website, I'll send a notice to this group so that you can just go and look and see what it looks like. Great. Great. All right.
right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us today. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email with the recording of today's webinar, as well as the link to the new uh, website. If anybody wants to get themselves registered, you can help be our first testers of outsiders. Um, <laughs> help us work through any of the other small kinks that might be there. Although Ryan and our, and our team of students did a fantastic job. So hopefully those will be minimal. And, um, <laughs> and maybe if anybody has data from a past year that they want to input, you can do that as well to your, for your garden once we get you set up with an account. Yeah, please, please send me any um, previous data that you have that was not on, um, that was not uploaded into the websites. Um, I can download those data that were public, but if you have additional data that you've collected that you didn't enter into any of our um, websites in the past year or past several years, please just send that to me. Great. And yeah, please register so that we, we can get the map started and connected to the gardens, even if you're not collecting the data this year. It would just help us if you could get registered. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone. This was fantastic. And thank you to our guests, Kat, Caroline, and Gonzalo. We really appreciate having you here with us today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you guys. This was wonderful. Great. See you all next time. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.